in your now at the old active day of Corpus Christi, which is celebrated very well in this Eucharistic community, and it is this evening the vigil of the Sacred Heart, which the Lord wanted us there. At the conclusion of this octave, it's a rounding up also of the combination of the liturgical year, in a sense, that cycle of Easter, and all that follows it. And we know that the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is winding down now, was of the Lord's initiative directly through Blessed Julien de Montaucomion in Belgium, who was given these visions of the moon with a bar on it, and she didn't know what it meant, and the Lord explained that it was his desire that there should be a feast in honour of the Blessed Sacrament, quite apart from the context of Holy Thursday. And then, of course, this development, as time has gone on, of the Sacred Heart is an extension also of that same thrust, that we have this personal relationship with our God. There had been, under the influence of Jansenism, this withdrawing from trust, confidence in the Lord, and therefore this withdrawing from Eucharistic contact in some countries, France notably, I think that, uh, Holland was involved. But anyway, the, um, because John Sidney wasn't here, was Utrecht or something like that. This question then of the Lord's desire is something that we need to bear in mind that our faith is a joyful faith in that we have the best friend on our side and that we have the powers of the universe as it were tamed. We have not this fear that we had on earth before the incarnation because just behind where I live, where my heritage is, there is one of the most ancient places of human culture, in a sense, pre-culture, on earth. It's what is called Newgrange, but that's a fairly recent name compared to the old name. Um, but anyway, Newgrange is like Stonehenge, and it's the same kind of thing, and they tracked the sun there, it was perfect. It's, it's been hung, it, they managed to calculate these things, and as in Stonehenge, it traps the sun on a certain day. That the, um, and um, in this place behind me, it's the shortest day of the year, if the sun exists that day in Ireland, that's the whole thing, and it comes down this shaft perfectly, and it's captured there, and it shines there on this kind of spot where obviously they have a notion of the power of, of the sun to somehow touch the dead or whatever. But anyway, it's, it's an amazing thing, and all these centuries, not a drop of water has come from outside. It's perfectly sealed. It's, Perfect architecture, as it were. So, anyway, these are all the people who, by the thousand, by the million, before Christianity, just went on and on into the dark without knowing where they were going. And they were afraid. And therefore, they had all these means of trying, in some way, to tame the dark. Now, we are living there after the fullness of Revelation and also the reopening of the door of paradise. Remembering that not even Adam, Moses, or any of the just could hope to get into the bit of vision until that door was reopened. So that is our faith, and therefore it is something that whatever else is happening in the rest of our life, we must bear in mind joy. My joy I leave with you. And it's not good to go through life aware so much that things are wrong that we lose that joy. And people need joy. And if one looks around, one sees that people massively, where they are not praying, are not in peace. They don't know that, but they're trying to fill that void with anything that is there, and it does not satisfy. So they try something else, stronger. That does not satisfy. It does for a while. But it only satisfies a bit of their being. So there is not joy. And if perhaps they have suffered a lot, they may actually come back to the unexpected. They may drift towards us. We have found in Ireland that people there 
because the faith is still there underneath, it is quite frequent that they do actually come back when things are going back. And therefore the priest is there, just quietly there. And one waits for that. When the Spirit has been working on their heart, these wounded souls, as it were, coming from the trench warfare of the war of life, bits of soul, bandaged and in shreds. Now, I want to, for a moment this afternoon, or this vigil of the Sacred Heart, enter into the joy of our God. Remember now, the Lord has given us this right to joy, not a joy of the superficial order, and that, by the way, is something that is often mistaken in, for instance, the fabrication of a certain false mode of hilarity and lightness in the liturgy, for instance. It's not made of more of the same thing. It's of a different order, but it's there and far more profound. It's being at one with the will that made us and wills us well. <coughs> St. Maximilian Kolbe, when he was forming his young people, he had this formula, which he would write on the blackboard and say, whatever language he was using, we say now equivalent in English, holiness, or sanctity, H, so we say, or S, is there when little W equals, and completely equals, big W. The little will equals the big will of God. That it's all that sanctity is, willing one will totally. And that gives a huge peace. Because when things aren't going as we, in our little will, are programming, then if we're not wedded to the will, we're going to be unhappy, but an unhappiness of our own making. If, on the other hand, our will has abdicated and has wedded the will that made us, then we just flow into that will and accept whatever form it gives when it manifests itself in the unexpected of the here and now. And that is part of the joy that we have, that we're always content. As St. Paul says, I have learned in whatever circumstances I am in to be there with content, freedom. Because out there in the world, as it were, people are depending on certain things happening for there to be joy. That, by the way, is something that we need to be aware of when it comes to what helps joy. Because there are certain things in our humanity which also help it, as certain things in our humanity do not help it. It is painful in our humanity to be living all the time with people who are not in joy. And it's very painful if one is living all the time, for instance, enclosed in a community where that would be the case, or even a marriage where that would be the case, where one person in particular might not be helpful. That is heroic sanctity on a daily basis. But there are other things which that we have right over, and we can help to have others to have access to as well, which help to create joy. I mean now, in the sacred field, let alone any other, when people are healed by the natural effect that beauty has on the deepest level of their being, then that helps them to encounter the creator of it all. Therefore, we have a duty in our measure in which we are responsible for controlling liturgy to make sure that God is only given the best. Shoddy, hurried liturgy and noisy and aggressive music does not create peace. It creates a certain unease and does not help us to enter into a calm mode. The experience of the centuries knows what actually heals. And it's not that difficult, even with simple means, as long as we have people who are in some way aesthetically aware. And therefore we have to be careful that it's not those who are not aesthetically aware 
who have access to the noise producing machines that make them join our assemblies. And that is happening more than we think. It is very difficult to know exactly how to function. I just open a parenthesis because it shows the problem. Just the other day, by chance, I was talking to a very intelligent Englishman who had been educated at Cambridge and had become an Anglican clergyman, and then, like many others, had become a Roman Catholic with his wife, with his own wife, and therefore they were able to come into the ordinary aids of Walsingham and to be ordained for this husband. And these people, actually our own parish in Wales has someone similar, uh, in the first he had an English when he came up with his wife, he speaks Welsh, he's been put in Canada, which is a very Welsh speaking parish, but normally these people, they're not supposed to be actually parish priests, but chaplains, but in fact what's happening is that because of the shortage of priests, they haven't got the exact title of parish priests, they are actually running parishes, they boil down to that. But however, they're very good people, and they, in a sense they've got this baggage, and they're, they're very good preachers and they're very good pastors. And he was telling me this, that he had noticed that there has been, as time has gone on, an increase in the participation in Sunday Mars, and obviously quite a substantial one, uh, in the parish that he was for, it's actually in Coventry, in the Birmingham Archdiocese. And, uh, and he ascribed it to one decision that he had had the courage to make almost in the teeth of the Archbishop. Now, there has been in Britain uh, an attempt in certain archdioceses to limit the number of celebrations, but quite radically, over the weekend in such a way that there can be a mutual help given within a certain, any deanery, that they can actually help each other and therefore not be clashing. Now, the result was that this very big parish actually was invited to be having only uh, on a Sunday morning one celebration, and he was aware of the problem which he had actually inherited. It was this, that, they, that, that, that had been already taken, that decision, and the result was they had one celebration in the middle of the morning, which was what he described as a mishmash. It was a mixture of all styles. And he saw this is chaos, and it's not really liturgically intelligent. And he was going to fight for it, and he actually won, because I suppose the bishop respected his intuition on ground level. We will have two celebrations, neatly distinct. The half past nine one will be aimed towards families and will be open to the younger spirit that might be coming to that celebration. And therefore, with reverence, he is open to what they might want, but he does it properly and it's full, it's packed of people with families and it works. Vibrant. And then, at whatever it might be, later, I suppose the middle of the morning, 11 or half past 11, the old high mass, basically, which they had had before, but it was mixed with this other stuff as well, you see. And uh, so there it's classical, in a sense, uh, a certain rituality, and a very good choir, which otherwise was kind of cheesed off. I mean. <laughs> but they see content as well, and these are people to be taken and harnessed. And so there they are, singing their hearts out and pulling all the organ stops out, and it's packed! So you see, it works, a bit of common sense. And, and therefore it's working also because people are being fed also on the human level, they're being respected in their needs and wants. One must not force what people actually, some people, and I mean quite often, the faithful middle-aged people are not. They're being frustrated because the, everything is being done for the youth. There might not be many. Oh, the point is, you see, if you go to a many a parish now throughout Europe, you'll find a, a similar situation arising, but as before, uh, people would have been complaining that only the choir did the singing and so on. What has come in, in many places, is this. A new specialization has happened, and there's not more but less participation on the level of the people. It's a young people's choir doing its thing, with specialized things in their book, and the people are just there letting it happen, and too polite to say anything. So, it goes both ways. Because people need, especially for a certain caliber and intellectual bent, they need also to be respected in their capacity for appreciation. Now, therefore, joy comes in all the levels of our being, including creating the best for God in which we too are caught up. 
And we look at the secret, for instance, of the success of the oratory, which started to send Philip near, right? But then went over the world, was that they harnessed the best of, for instance, musical, musical culture at the time, Palestrina and so on, and therefore gave people, ordinary people, a boost, uh, a certain uplift by these means which are God given, because beauty is something which links us to the creator of order. There is a harmony in the universe which we perceive through high powered musical beauty. The word means the art of the muses, musiche, musiche techne. And even that therefore is pre Christian, but it's something in philosophy, something in, in the human nature, the psyche. It loves harmony. And by the way, young people even are aware of it. The reason why, for instance, the Beatles were successful in the 60s, partly, was that they were actually creating a modern form of true harmony. It's actually clever music, the best of it now. Because it actually they were going into harmony, they were creating good music, and therefore that is of value. And then after that, young people, as time has gone on, by now, they're not exposed even to good popular music. They're exposed to synthesized electronic noise. And it's not the same. What they're listening to is it's not at all the same. So there's been, even on the human level, a regression in musical culture, and young people are not exposed to that otherness anymore, especially if you don't get in church either. So, on that level, we are also involved in culture. Now, yes, and I was going to mention this with regard to the success then that these people had on the level of getting through to souls. They used the best of what was in culture, and of course that came through. I mentioned Newman earlier. He had that intuition. He didn't know which way to go because he was full of the Anglican baggage. And he went to Rome, and he was moved by precisely this spirit of openness to the best of all that was there. And he came back with this particular movement, the oratory, and planted it in Birmingham, the second largest city in the British Isles. And then from there, with favour, and his own help, it went to Brompton, very important one in London. Now it's gone to Oxford. They've got a big one from the Jesuits, St. Aloysius. Now it's gone to Manchester. They've got the big one there in the university area, uh, the Holy Name. So it's, on, it's, it's ongoing. Each of these has a beautiful liturgy in which God is glorified and man is healed. And they're packed with people. Now, I want to come just for a moment this afternoon into the power of our God, who is joy. I had, when I was young, a friend who was a hermit. He spoke Welsh, like us. He was a hermit in the middle of Wales, in the country. I had actually been to the same school as my father, and he was the same age. He had become an Eastern Orthodox priest, monk, archimandrite, and hermit. And he had this hermitage where I used to spend time. And from him, I learned about what happens in the Holy Land every year, which was quite surprising. He, he took it very calmly because he knew all about it and it happens every year. It's the explosion of joy that's there on Holy Saturday, but it's not just man-made, it's divine. And so I wanted to know more about this. And a few months ago, through my providence, I was there in the Holy Sepulchre, aware of the power of it, and I wanted to get as much information as I could. I bought some, a whole book actually from an Eastern Orthodox monk who was not far away, and all the knowledge there in English, and just historically documented, and I was also able to investigate on YouTube. There's a lot of material on it in YouTube, a lot in Greek, but it has uh, subtitles and things, and, and there's a lot of material now that one can actually use. While well, handling these things with young people, for instance, because they're all electrified, and they're all able to have access to these things, and they're things which, as I say, without getting into an argument, indicate objective truth. And you leave them with that. It's no problem afterwards. Now, this was causing some 
puzzle to this gentleman here. I just picked this up because I have to have it with me. It's uh, an, an account. Do you really mean to say that your patriarch lights the Paschal candle by a miracle? I now ask the monk, dumbfounded after the lady who had just been hanging on his every word finally set him free again. You know, see, this lady had, it was explaining what happened, and he was a bit puzzled. Is this true or not? How could you ever think to doubt it? He hissed, shaking his head at me. This fire falls 100% from heaven. It is an absolutely supernatural process. This fire is not made by human hands. Not made by human hands? Back then, I did not yet know the expression as I do today, and would not have taken it so seriously either. And on he goes. Now, his friend the Armenian was crafty. You can never get in to the Holy Sepulchre on Holy Saturday unless you've got someone you know. <laughs> so he got him in. And there were like sardines in there, crushed against this pillar. Wow! This was something else. Are you ready? This very ancient ceremony began. The patriarch going around three times, fully vested. And then he, before everyone, is divested of all until he gets to just one layer and there are nothing, there's nothing on his being at all. I think he actually opens, he shows there's nothing on his being. And before then, the Holy Sepulchre has been sealed by the church authorities, or even by the priest, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's very solemnly done, after having been searched. That's very important. And though, so there, then, after all this buzz, silence, he goes in. And then, everyone's waiting. And then, it's not just inside, but outside, that things happen. All in one flash after flash. I think you can see here, it's in court. You see it coming? These flashes are coming from heaven towards the Holy Sepulchre and towards certain people in the place. It's people who, as they say, are Catholic, clean, pure, monks and nuns in a state of grace, often have it as well at the same time. <laughs> lights, the candle lights, and um, they, have, they have these candles with 33 little candles in them, a bunch of candles. And then, of course, it's happening inside, and out he comes to see, he has to go into this place you see in utter darkness. He comes out, and when the doors open, of course, all the church, all, the, all these bells are ringing, and he's coming out, and the whole interior of the Holy Sepulchre is full of light. You can see it, and he's coming out with these two big bunches of candles, waving them like this with great joy. And those who have not had the fire, they get them from there. And in a very short time, the whole place is full of light. And then those who know about it start to play with the fire. Monks and nuns, women, play with the fire. It doesn't burn for the first minutes. Nothing happens, nothing goes wrong in the flame filled basilica. And also, and this is important, those who have this miracle, and they hold it to their face, feel the power of heavenly joy coming from the flame. It's not a flame like the flame in ordinary oil lamps of the basilica, which are all extinguished, and some of which light. In fact, always the Holy One kept always a light in the basilic, in the Holy Sepulchre itself, inside, is extinguished before the ceremony, before everyone's eyes, and that one always is lit by heaven. 
and then some others also might be for instance, above it. You can see you can see on amateur videos and things which ones have been lit well, just been lit by heaven. And so, and then this flame is carried and spread around the Christian world. And designated airlines allow a covered but a living flame to go to certain important places so the patriarchates of the world inhabit by the Holy Nights. That's why it happens at the same time every day on Holy Saturday, not on the midnight, because it's too late for it to get to these other places. It happens around two. And um, there it is, it's happened since at least the finishing of the Basilica by Constantine the Great. We know that, since the church was there. We have all the documents. Now, the interesting thing is that we didn't know much about what happened in there. It was all secret. All that one could know was that there was no way that they could fabricate it before long means, mm -hmm. because there's no way, way back. And therefore it was presumed to be authentic. But what has happened is that in recent times, the last succession of patriarchs, and also one who was standing in for one, because in those places they die in office, not like um, our bishops have to retire, and uh, one of them had become too old to go inside, he was on a wheelchair, and so he had to go as near as he could, and then he just to another bishop to go inside and have it in his hands. And so, and he also testified to exactly what happened. They to know, and they actually told them exactly step by step what happened. The law corresponds. They all said the same thing. And so, we know. Now, I will just today leave you with this meditation based on, therefore, what he writes. Bearing in mind that the holy light of which this speaks, we have it already in Scripture. We notice here in Matthew chapter 28 that we have light always mentioned when it comes to the resurrection. His face was like lightning, his robe white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they were like dead men, and so on. This holy light has been always intuitively perceived as being in the gospel already. So here we are. This is the testimony of Patriarch Theodorus, Theodorus I. Now remember, it has to happen in his hands. He is historically the direct successor of St. James, and that is respected because the church was always one until 1054, but that has gone on. It happens at their date. The Lord is a wise God and he doesn't get involved with political arguments. There's peace there, at least on that, but we know exactly what's going to happen from year to year. I step into the tomb. He's answering the question, now just bit by bit, what happens? He writes, he's actually writing this down. And kneel down in holy fear before the stone bench on which Jesus was laid to rest after his death, from which he rose again from the dead. And by the way, you know that in the Holy Sepulchre, because of tensions, the major part is in the hands of the Greeks, it always has been, but it's actually only two thirds, because they have, way back they have made an opening at the other end, and there they have allowed the Copts to have a tiny portion. And they have a, a chapel there, but that's, strangely enough, the only part which has something close to the original stone, a, a tiny bit there, because you see, they have covered and protected it there in the Holy Sepulchre itself with what is also an altar. But the other one is more primitive, so that tiny bit is actually the real thing in a sense. Uh, but the, the actual major portion is there, and as you'll see from hearing this, um, it happens there and in a specific way there. Listen. I find my way in the dark and fall on my knees. At this point, I recite certain prayers that were handed down to us over the centuries. Greek, obviously, and I await, sometimes a few minutes, but usually the miracle occurs right after the prayer. An indescribable light seeps from within the stone on which Jesus was laid. 
Normally, it has a blue tint, but the colour can change and assume many hues. Human words cannot be described. The light ascends like mist from the sea. It almost looks as though the stone is surrounded by a cloud, but it is a light. It behaves differently from one ear to the next. Sometimes it covers only the stone. Other times it illumines the whole burial chamber so that the people waiting in the church see the tomb full of light. And even actually the sun sometimes behaves in a strange way just before, and back in, you see on YouTube you can see it, and at the moment in which it started to ignite therein, that stops things that way. It's difficult to explain, but there's obviously a cosmic force there igniting something. It does not burn. In the 16 years in which I have now been Patriarch of Jerusalem, I have never yet burned my beard. The light has a different consistency from the fire that burns in the oil lamps. At a particular point, it rises up and forms a pillar. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> At which I can light my candle. So the Lord is it was stooping down, that's very interesting, isn't it? The, the, the delicacy of our God. Come on, come on, come on. And he can light his light from this now formed column. Otherwise, it's just light all over the place. After I have received the fire, I go out and give it to the Armenian Patriarch, then to the Coptic Patriarch, and then to all the people who are in the church. From this point on, I myself am now an eyewitness, for I myself in turn have experienced it with the explosion of light through the whole space and the ringing and toning of the bells which goes through the very marrow of your bones and seems that it will never stop to proclaim the news of Christ's resurrection from the dead and of the reappearance of the holy light to the city and to all the earth. The light that condensed into a little pillar reminded her, my wife said, of the pillar of fire in Sinai, in which God went before the Israelites at night and showed his people the way out of the desert into the promised land. Now, I just will leave you with that, my friends, because it's important that we be aware of these things, because if we're handling people who are thinking that they know it all, young people who draw a lot of science, if they're really scientific, they are also thirsting for scientia in its totality, and if they're afraid of approaching certain evidence, it indicates that they're not. They have to be also mature in their dialogue and logic, so calmly, without raising one's voice, one indicates further sources of knowledge. And also, and I'll leave you with this, since we're in the mode of resurrection, it is important to be aware that actually we have a new element of science on our side, which was not the case only a few years ago. The BBC has very good documentation. It's done just by ordinary open neutral television, and it's all on YouTube, on the problem that what we call NDE has created for natural science. NDE is now fairly frequent because of what happens through modern surgery. It's near-death experience. And certain things are coming through common enough in tone to indicate a consensus that certain things happen after death. Now, one case, amongst others, 
is of extreme importance for science because of the way in which scientifically it was followed right through. I believe her name was Pamela Reynolds. It's Reynolds, certainly. I believe it's Pamela. And she was from Australia, I think, or New Zealand, one of those countries. And she had an aneurysm in, the part, in a part of the brain which was so inaccessible that no surgeon would handle it. It was just on the other side, as it were. One had the courage to try. A really good one. But he knew that the only chance of success was to induce brain death. Total, total absence of activity in the brain. So, with ultramodern means, they did just that. And therefore, all her brain movements will be monitored. That's the scientific bit which comes into play. So, what happened? Off she went. And then, they started the operation. At a certain point, they had to try and get hold of the veins so as to drain them, I believe. But anyway, the point is they had to get veins, and you couldn't get veins in one leg or something. And there was a doctor, the surgeon said, try the other. So they did, and they got what they wanted. Okay. At another point, they started to get into the brain. And the surgeon said, saw the saw. And next, they went into the brain. Now, I leave all that happened there. Eventually, this long operation was over, and she was induced back into life. But what was not the surprise of the medical staff when she was able to say exactly about these veins, what happened there, the sound, uh, is the noise that saying that we had to have the saw, and then the sound of the saw, and also what it looked like. It looked like a modern device, something resembling the tooth, modern tooth brush thing that her father had in a case and everything, and it was exactly corresponding, although she was even speaking, she couldn't see these things, to what actually it was. Now, therefore, what was coming through there was, and these were scientists on the BBC discussing it balancedly and, and totally, without any prejudice, this is posing a new problem for science. And it was putting it in parallel with other experiments of the same or experiments with experiences of the same kind. Science now, and it's a big one, is saying that the evidence is that the soul has its own self-sufficient existence independent of the brain. Now that is pure science drawing a logical conclusion. And these are not the people selling anything on the box. They are pure scientists and doctors at the highest level. So this is the kind of stuff to be aware of and handling a young person who thinks he or she knows it all.